Hello everyone, I'm Anshul Malhotra and I lead the research team here at RippleX. Um, it's been almost three years now that I'm at Ripple. Um, well, um, one of the focus areas of research um, at Ripple has been to design new protocols and primitives uh, on XRP Ledger to enable more secure, more private, pro-compliance and interoperable applications. And to give our developers community, the developers community on XRP Ledger, the best in class platform to build their use cases. And when we talk about enabling more applications and more use cases, one thing that we must think about is the scalability. So that's another research um, area that we are exploring within the research team. And we are looking at more advanced cryptographic primitives, such as uh, zero knowledge proof systems, uh, and also looking at both uh, layer one and layer two solutions to improve scalability. So that's what I do. But today I'm really, really excited to talk about the automated market maker based decentralized exchange, something uh, that we have been working on most recently uh, to add support on XRP Ledger. And I'm really glad to have uh, Shihao and Java here with us today uh, to share their thoughts on the topic. So let's get started. Um, uh, do you want to introduce yourself, uh, Java? Sure. Uh, yes, my name is Jia Xu. I am a uh, lecturer in financial computing at University College London, UCL. I am also a research associate at the University Center for Blockchain Technologies, CBT. Um, I'm also a, a program director of the Master, uh, Master of Science in Emerging Digital Technologies um, of the university. Um, my, current fo my current research focus actually lies in exactly decentralized finance, and I've been looking into the mechanisms of DeFi protocols, such as major AMM protocols, automated market making protocols, uh, lending protocols, uh, yield farming protocols, and uh, insurance protocols. Um, I also look into uh, risk management, uh, <coughs> behavioral finance, um, and general blockchain economics. Thanks. Thank you. Xihao? Hi, my name is Xihao Yu. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, Columbia University in New York. And also I'm affiliated with the uh, uh, Digital Center uh, at the Columbia University. And before my postdoc, I did a PhD back in Amsterdam in finance. And my research is focused on market microstructure. And now I'm actually taking what we actually know from the traditional finance market microstructure to the DeFi world. And my current research is on MMs, and we're actually looking at how the trading mechanisms on MMs actually differs from the traditional, let's say, club, the central name order book market. And we're trying to look at, for example, the information content of the gas fees, which is actually kind of a crucial feature that uh, you need to trade on the uh, automated market makers. Awesome, thank you. All right, so to set the stage, I would like to open up by getting high-level thoughts um, on what a decentralized exchange is, what automated market makers are, where do they come from, and you know how do they compare to the more sort of traditional central limit order book-based decentralized exchanges. Um, uh, Java? Yes, uh, I guess it would probably help if we just uh, give a high-level explanation mm -hmm. for those who are not familiar with AMM protocols, what an AMM actually is. Well, AMM, uh, as briefly mentioned, stands for automated market makers, and uh, uh, AM AMM algorithms have been widely adopted in uh, decentralized uh, finance, DeFi uh, exchanges, or, or DEXs, uh, decentralized exchanges. Um, different from order book based exchanges mm -hmm. with uh, AMMs, you don't match a buyer and a, and a seller. So when a trade is, is, is executed, there's, there's no buyer-seller pair. Instead, on an AMM, the, uh, the trade is executed according to a conservation function, or what we call a bonding curve. So the price between two assets uh, is actually algorithmically determined by this bonding curve. Um, so in that sense, uh, when an exchange user comes in and make a trade, this person is actually not trading with a, with a 
so to speak, trading counterparty, but instead this person's trade is trading against uh, the so-called liquidity pool. And we have, uh, on the other side of the story, we have the liquidity providers who will first and foremost pull, uh, put some funds, some liquidity into, into a pool, a smart contract pool. And based on the state or the balance um, of uh, the reserves within the smart contract, the conservation function would automatically calculate what's the, what's the next, uh, what the exchange rate should be. Um, as such, uh, with AMMs, you can guarantee some kind of, uh, this kind of continuous liquidity. So you wouldn't, uh, and when an exchange user comes in, uh, he or she would not be afraid that the order wouldn't be taken because the order will always be taken uh, continuously, the price will be automatically determined uh, by the bonding curve. Uh, yeah, so that's basically the, the, the advantage of using an AMM. Usually with a, with a decentralized, uh, sorry, with, a, with an order book based uh, mechanism, you would have to input, let's say, four variables. One is what you are selling, the asset that you're selling. A second one, the asset you're buying. The third one is the quantity of the asset that you're selling. And the fourth one is the quantity of the asset that you're buying. So those four variables. Whereas with an AMM, you only, uh, you only input three out of those four variables. So the quantity of the selling asset, the, the, uh, what the selling asset is, and the, what the buying asset is. And the quantity of the buying asset will be automatically calculated uh, by the bonding curve. Thank you. That would be, your, <laughs> would be my explanation, so go ahead. Yeah, I think Jiahao has done an excellent job explaining the uh, training mechanisms of AMMs. And I think just one point I want to add is actually why AMMs are suitable for actually uh, blockchain, um, on, uh, actually on-chain trading. Uh, it's actually because of a scalability issue. So if I can draw some lessons we learn from the traditional financial markets, if you think about equity trading, like if you think about LASTAC or LICI, they're all actually wrong a central name order book. And the think about how you treat a stock, right? So you want to actually buy, you send an order through your broker, let's say you use actually Robinhood, right? Which is actually popular now among retail investors. And the order will actually be sent through your broker to the exchange. And the exchange run a mention engine, which is essentially a central name order book. You say you want to buy a stock, you specify the price, the quantity that you want to actually buy. And then your bid order will be added to the central name order book. And this is actually how you provide a price to the, uh, to the exchange. And of course, for you, you want to actually buy the security. You're actually kind of a natural buyer. But the prices actually in the central name order book in the traditional markets are largely submitted by market makers. Right? You think about Citadel, you think about Virtue. Those guys are actually submitting quotes into the central name order books constantly. And the issue with that is um, they have to watch the market constantly because the price can change at every minute. So in order to sort of not be ever selected, you have to keep changing the quotes you submitted. But it's not actually doable on chain because for each order uh, modification, that actually needs to be sort of validated or mined by the, uh, by, by the miners or validators. So first, first of all, it's actually quite slow. And second, that you need to actually pay a blockchain fee. So because of these two issues, it's not actually Scalable to actually do a central name order book on chain. That's why that MMs, which actually has that so called a passive liquidity provision, is actually suitable, right? So, as a liquidity provider, you don't have to really watch your orders. You don't have to change your prices, you just actually deposit your tokens into the pool, and then you let actually the market to actually decide the price, right? So, I think that's kind of one point I want to add that actually makes automated market makers kind of a suitable training mechanism for the on chain trading not just suitable, I would add probably more advantages, exactly as right. what you said, because uh, because of the nature, distributed nature of, of, of blockchain, you have a, a, a same copy of the, of, the, of the ledger information with every single node, and uh, with uh, this AMM mechanism, all you need to store is a simple formula, it's just the bonding curve formula, the conservation function formula. You don't have to store the information of the whole uh, big chunks of order books, so that's actually really cost efficient and really advantageous to, to implement uh, in a distributed environment. Awesome, thanks. So that's, that tells us where AMMs come from, what are their advantages over 
more like order book based exchange. Let's talk about the other side. <laughs> what are some of the things that you think have not worked in this area based on your research in this area and um, in DeFi space more generally? So what are the disadvantages of, let's say, automated market maker on blockchains? Uh, well, if I may go first, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so um, one thing that has been heavily discussed in this space is what we call um, the impermanent loss or divergence loss. So this is a loss that uh, liquidity providers would encounter when they uh, when they provide liquidity into the liquidity pool and uh, in the end actually they're holding the portfolio of their um, uh, of their funds would become less valuable compared to the scenario where they do not provide liquidity whatsoever at all because of the nature of the of the market uh, exchange users would always trade uh, less valuable, always well, let's say dump less valuable tokens into the liquidity pool to 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 withdraw or to 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 extract more valuable uh, assets from the liquidity pool. So as the time goes uh, with with some market movement, the um, the portfolio of liquidity providers value would deteriorate. Of course, there are mechanisms out there to compensate for this. Uh, for this type of uh, uh, loss uh, on the side of liquidity providers, such as um, uh, fees, exchange fees. So every exchange would, uh, uh, every swap would uh, um, be charged a, a fraction of fee to compensate for this kind of uh, impermanent loss. And then there's some kind of uh, impermanent loss insurance mechanism adopted by uh, by some AMMs, but so far there hasn't been a very elegant solution out there. Um, there's always some kind of trade-off. We have Uniswap version three for those who are more familiar with with Dexas, uh, where they uh, where you can select kind of your your uh, a range of liquidity provision uh, in which send well where actually. You can get more concentrated liquidity, uh, uh, more concentrated liquidity provision, gather more fee, have deeper liquidity pool, but will suffer more uh, with liquidity, uh, so with impermanent loss. And then there are some solutions out there that alleviate impermanent loss a little bit, but uh, would uh, uh, other problems would arise, such as uh, diluted. Um, diluted liquidity, siloed liquidity, and so on and so forth. So thus far, there's just no one single solution that would fit all. I guess that's a design problem of AMM that uh, that can be looked into further. Your thoughts, Michelle? Yeah, I would like to actually point out that trading on automated market makers, because it's on-chain exchange, everything is transparent, right? If you think about it, when you actually send an order to the MM, the order don't act, doesn't go to the MMs directly, right? You first actually, okay, first you use a node to broadcast your orders to your peer nodes, and then the node who actually receives the transaction will actually store in their mempool, right? So it's actually a place where all the pending orders will be actually first stored before a miner will actually, or a validator will actually select out of the mempools which transaction they will actually weld into put on chain, right? So from the start of the order creation, the waiting period is all transparent or observed to all, right? If you're actually kind of arbitrager that can monitor the mempool constantly, you know who is gonna actually trade a large chunk of a token, and that actually creates the so-called front-running issue, right? So I think very sort of typical front-running attack is called sandwich attack, right? So you actually think about if you actually see a large buy order in the mempool, you can just try to bid a higher gas fee to actually buy actually before the pending orders, get that transacted and then actually sell back to that order at a higher price. So it can actually, so that's actually a cost to the large uh, buyer, right? Because I mean, the, because we need actually liquidity for those sort of natural buyers to facilitate their trading. But if it's actually too costly for them, that's kind of where for loss. So I think that's actually one kind of big issue in the uh, uh, automated market makers trading space. Yeah, I totally agree. There was a talk in the morning early in the earlier session. They've been working on that's called game theory of front running, um, and there's this 
There are a lot of solutions coming up in the form of commit and reveal schemes um, where you can hide the information in the order to prevent such kind of attacks. But yes, it definitely is a real problem in a number of blockchains. And this gives a perfect segue to discuss a little bit about XLS30. For those of you who don't, do not know, we recently proposed um, an automated native support for automated market maker on XRP Ledger. Um, and I would like to get your thoughts on how do you think like XRP Ledger has some inherent cool features compared to other blockchains? How do you think XRP Ledger is uniquely positioned to support a more lucrative and more efficient uh, automated market maker? Yeah, um, as, uh, as, as Lauren just mentioned, the, X the XRP Ledger actually uh, implements the uh, well, one of the first uh, kind of DEX version in the in the DLT space, XRP Ledger natively actually has uh, decentralized exchanges. It's just previously it was supporting um, uh, order book based decentralized exchanges. Now it's supporting AMM. It's just something that's very powerful. And compared to the existing solutions that are widely seen. Uh, on EVM compatible chains such as well, Ethereum, uh, Polygon, BNB chain, and so on and so forth, um, uh, this particular uh, the XRP ledger solution is as instead of being uh, implemented on the application level, it is actually native to the chain. As 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 far as I understand, it is actually implemented uh, directly on the on the chain level, on on layer one, so to speak. And I think that has a lot of advantages. For example, well, we have all the liquidity all on layer one. You can you can you can utilize uh, the liquidity to increase liquidity efficiency. And secondly, we all know that, uh, well, Shihao was just saying uh, the problem with other EVM compatible chains, um, the fact that miners can be bribed uh, with higher um, a gas fee, and then they can uh, they can they can well reorder the transactions, causing front running. Uh, this kind of issue, these issues uh, would be mitigated on the XRP ledger uh, due to different sorting mechanism. Actually, definitive sorting mechanism such that validators would not be bribed, um, and also uh, due to the, uh, the different consensus mechanism, which is much more efficient on the XRP ledger compared to other other chains, uh, it reduces also settlement latency and it also makes attacks such as front running and also sandwich attacks that Shuhao just mentioned uh, far more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yes, Shuhao, do you want to add something? Yeah, so I think there's actually one feature as far as it stands about the, uh, um, uh, the uh, design is actually there is an auction feature. So mm -hmm. basically, <laughs> As I actually mentioned, that arbitrageurs will always actually run to actually trade on arbitrage opportunities, like for example, popping information. And there is an auction feature I found interesting. There is actually they, for example, for the next I think 24 hours a day, um, the arbitrageurs will actually first engage in an auction. That you have to win the auction in order to actually trade on the potential arbitrage opportunities in, in actually the next 24 hours. And so basically. They first do auction, and all the profits they actually win from the auction will actually goes to the liquidity providers in the pool. So basically, you mitigate the future, let's say, sandwich attacks or this kind of arbitrage profits, and and even better, you actually start to the auction and get get and get the profits and actually give it back to the liquidity providers. I find that's actually a, an interesting design. Awesome. Yeah, I I would just like to add one more thing. We talked about um, why automated market makers exist. And one of the reasons we talked about is that scalability problem of uh, blockchains that the club based Texas cannot really scale well on public blockchains because of the higher transaction fee. Well, the transaction fee on XRP Ledger is almost zero, close to zero. So it's really, really a possible for even the club based Texas to thrive on XRP Ledger. So that's another really cool feature, I think, um, that XRP Ledger. And also, the AMM on XRP Ledger combines the good of both worlds. So it's an integrated DEX, which uh, uh, includes the 
like the advantages of both the order book based exchange as well as the automated market maker based exchange. I think both of them have their pros and cons and you get the best of both worlds, um, both worlds here. Yeah, uh, but, yeah I, I agree. I just want to, based on my personal experience uh, as well, uh, well, we know there was this DeFi summer period when the gas fee on Ethereum was mm -hmm. uh, just uh, too high, in, uh, um, intimidatingly high, uh, such that s sometimes a swap wouldn't, if it's, if it's not of large, sufficiently large scale, it would just not make sense. Um, so uh, definitely, I think a uh, small fee would, would encourage also more, more liquidity, would not just facilitate, but also encourage um, more swaps. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just uh, more well, user friendly, so to say, yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, so, well, you have been doing research in this area for quite some time. What, what excites you the most in this space and what are some of the future research directions you think this uh, industry is heading towards? Um, so I've been uh, speaking about uh, mechanisms. So I personally am interested in uh, mechanism design of AMMs. What I, what I currently see is that there's probably um, a uh, blank space in the research for uh, AMMs for derivatives. So we have a kind of maturing uh, protocols for, for the spot market where well, you, you make a trade and then you get, you, 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 you get uh, the uh, token that you want to swap straight away. That's, that's okay. But when it comes to financial derivatives, things get a little bit more complicated. There is a time element in there. Um, the, the derivative market in the uh, traditional financial market, even it's, it's a lot of them, they're either um, an order book based or, or, or over the counter based. It's just when, as mentioned at the very beginning, when this kind of mechanism, when that's implemented on a distributed network, it's just not cost efficient. So how to efficiently incorporate AMM uh, into derivative market on blockchain, that's something that I find uh, quite interesting. Although there are solutions out there, actually, if you uh, do a bit of a search uh, online, you can, you can find some derivative protocols, DeFi derivative protocols out there. But as a matter of fact, they are um, not yet as decentralized as we wish they are. Uh, some of them, they are still not AMM based, but rather order book based, which has some storage issue, which is not as efficient. Or some of them, they actually uh, use oracles to fetch data from centralized exchanges, which we think might to some extent, well, partially also defeat the purpose. So how to kind of design a native uh, self-contained AMM mechanism for 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 derivative market, I think has uh, has huge potential. Something that's uh, w that would be very very interesting. Thanks. Is that something that you're working on? Right uh, now? <laughs> I'm trying to. I think I think the first problem that we need to we need to solve is to understand the time element and 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 interest rate. So in order to design AMM, we take a step back. Now we are actually <laughs> looking at interest rates in the DeFi protocols. Uh, I think that that would also need uh, require us to also look into the lending uh, market because when you're pricing uh, something, when you're pricing derivative futures forwards, you're pricing something uh, from the future, there, there, there needs to be a time di uh, discount as well. And that requires us to, to look at uh, interest rates. We look into interest, whether interest parity holds or not in the DeFi market. So we take a step back. We, we look into that first, but the final goal is to come up with a nice design, AMM design for, uh, yeah, for DeFi. Yeah, it's very interesting. There are these Legos that we exactly. need to build exactly. these protocols. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, I know you've been talking a lot about oracles. You've been looking at oracles. Um, what are your thoughts um, about the requirement of oracles in the DeFi space and automated market makers? And there's, there are solutions out there, but they're not like good enough. Um, do you want to 
talk a little bit about that? Yeah, maybe I want to start with why kind of Oracle has been proposed mm -hmm. as a solution, right? As Jiahua actually mentioned before, that actually one issue with the automated market maker is so-called permanent actually loss. That's because when you're trading a token, the token fundamental price can change, right? And because it's, it, it's unlike central name order book market, as a market maker, if you want to change the mid quote, it's very easy, right? You can just cancel your existing quote and update with a new quote to change the price. There's barely actually no cost. But for automated market makers, the price does not change by itself, right? You have to trade in order to move the price because there's actually no resting orders or quotes on some book that you can change directly or easily. So that's why that when there's a price change, for example, if the uh, token price changes and then the automate, uh, the, the price on AMMs is actually different from the central exchanges, it's always the arbitrageurs who's actually the first trying to run to trade on the automated market makers, trying to align the prices across both exchanges, right? So the idea of Oracle is actually you sort of you, you sort of actually source a data feed from the outside the chain. For example, if you get the data feed from the central exchanges where the price can be more easily changed, and you feed that actually price back into the DEX, trying to automatically actually update the, uh, the, the part there. But I mean, I mean, the issue is actually, for example, if you really, okay, first of all, I don't think it's a very decentralized solution. You need to actually got some data from outside the chain, right? I think that's the first issue. And the second is actually where should we actually look for that data? There are maybe many different data providers. Should I go to data provider A or B or C? Do we have a consensus over which data feed is actually the most accurate, right? That data feed uh, provides us the most accurate price of the fundamental of the token. I think those are actually kind of hard questions to answer. That's why, although Oracle has been proposed as a solution, but it still has some actually other issues that we need to tackle. I totally agree. I think another problem is the security when you're relying on external information to bring to a blockchain. Uh, security becomes a huge issue, and we have seen hacks happening on all these uh, decentralized, so called decentralized oracles as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's, a, that's a, a good research direction to look at. Um, awesome. Um, any parting thoughts? I hope we did good justice on unraveling <laughs> the mystic AMM. Um, but if not, then we can open it up to QA for a bit. Yeah. Yep. If there are questions from the audience. Oh, there's, I see there's one hand there. Yeah, please. Is there a mic? Uh, th thank you guys for a very interesting and very insightful talk. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about the idea of information transmission in market design as well as adverse selection. So if you're recalling classic models of you know, market microstructure broker-dealer relationships such as the Kyle model, the market maker has the ability to internalize the private information of market participants by looking at their willingness to, um, to place an order, so to speak, right? But um, contrary to this, in automated market makers, liquidity providers cannot actually have the authority to refuse a trade once that they've committed to providing liquidity. And I think this is partially the reason why, you know, if you look at recent articles by Bancor, more than half of liquidity providers are actually consistently losing money on average. So do you think, you know, right now there are feasible solutions to try to, you know, mitigate for this lack of strategic flexibility on the part of the market maker? Um, and do you think, you know, in terms of either trading fees or changing the structure of the liquidity pool setup or by yield farming, that there is a way to overcome this and to make sure everything is in equilibrium? Do you want to answer? Yeah, uh, sure. So I think that's, that's what I mentioned uh, close to the beginning, the, the impermanent loss. Uh, issue that you were mentioning. Um, I think the current solutions in the market, implemented in the market, are just a bit too naive. You mentioned uh, uh, you mentioned uh, exchange fees, and obviously, in most cases, exchange fees are just not sufficient to cover the impermanent loss. Uh, in 
unless you, uh, you you provide liquidity to kind of like stable coin pairs where the where where the price fluctuation um, is to a lesser extent. Otherwise, usually, uh, yeah, the, your your profit would just be eaten up by impermanent loss. Again, I think something could be done. I haven't seen this been done yet, but I think something could be done with fee structure. I mean, at the end of the day. The relationship between uh, liquidity providers and traders, it is a zero-sum game. If somebody wins, somebody will have to lose. So if we want to compensate for, uh, for liquidity providers, then, then exchange users, they just have to pay a sufficient fee. Uh, currently, the fees are uh, based on the, well, with most protocols, the fees are very, very naive, straightforward, and simple. It's just based on your, your, your volume. It's just a fraction of volume. But I think fees can be a bit more dynamic. Uh, I think there are protocols out there that are already looking into this kind of fees, maybe at different, um, uh, in different uh, uh, ranges, price ranges, the fees can, can be adjusted. And also, uh, Shihao mentioned uh, Oracle. We could probably also pull external uh, information, um, uh, leveraging you know, external uh, market uh, prices to, to set a more, more fair fee. But again, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a zero-sum game. If somebody wins, somebody will have to lose. So, uh, exchange users, they, they are always incentivized to get more valuable tokens out from the liquidity pool and dump less valuable tokens into the liquidity pool. But as if they have more kind of uh, self-explainable utility towards the tokens that they trade out, then I think they, they should just pay a bit of fee to, to sufficiently compensate for the liquidity provision services provided by liquidity providers. But yeah, to sum up, fees can be more sophisticated. Awesome. Great.